of Cape Crusaders, please join me in welcoming a very special guest to our show. He's the writer of three episodes of Batman the Animated Series, as well as a writer for shows such as Beetlejuice, X-Men the Animated Series, Superman the Animated Series, Spider-Man the Animated Series, Gargoyles, The Mask, Extreme Ghostbusters, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and many more. Please welcome Marty Eisenberg to the show. Marty, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm all right. Thanks for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Um, so for our listeners, you wrote three episodes of Batman, which were... His co-wrote, sil- yes. Co-wrote, sorry, yes, of course. Um, which were His Silicon Soul, What is Reality, and Lock Up. So as I told you before, we had uh, Robert and Skier, your writing partner on the show, not too long ago. Uh, and he credited you with coming up with most of the story and the dialogue for His Silicon Soul and What is Reality. So we had a really good chat about Lock Up and we had good chats about His Silicon Soul and What is Reality. But there was a lot of that was Marty's idea. That was Marty. That was Marty. So I'd love to chat with more with you about those as well today. But first, how did you get the job writing for Batman the Animated Series? Um, the nepotism mostly. No, I, uh, <laughs> I add slightly. I, I was um, I was working for the Fox Kids Network, which was the the American broadcaster of the show, and uh, that's that's how uh, Bob and I got to write on Beetlejuice. Is we we had the inside track. So there was uh, luckily there was a director of programming there, a guy named by the name of Sidney Iwater, who was the exec on Batman and had been previously the exec on Beetlejuice. Um, And he was a guy who liked to nurture and torture writers. Um, So I was just working as a uh, a receptionist answering phones, and he found out that I was interested in writing. So he said, hey, you should come and uh, write for for our shows. We're we're always looking for good writers. Most writers who write for animation are terrible, so you have uh, a good chance of getting on the show. (laughs) Introduced us to the story, uh, one of the story editors on Beetlejuice. And uh, we were told, well, we could probably give you an episode. And uh, we did the first episode and they liked it so much, we ended up doing six more. So that was was the beginning of our our animation career. And then um, as we were writing Beetlejuice, we found out, or I found out, that um, that was part of an overall deal with Warner Brothers and and Fox Kids, and that the next series, the next new series they were going to be doing was Batman. And um, I saw what is now the the legendary test animation. It, it, it later became the the main title or a version of the main title, but yeah. there was there was an original test animation that that they did, and you know it came into Fox, and we saw it. We were all blown away by it. So that must have I, been a really cool sizzle reel for you all to see. Oh, it was it was so exciting. It's like, oh my God. You know, so the first, you know, the first uh instinct is gotta find a way to get on the show, gotta find yeah. a way to write for it. Um, so I managed to dub a copy on the sly of the uh of the test footage and I handed it off to Bob and just said to him, You don't know what this is, you don't know where it came from. You have never seen it. That's all I can tell you. Um, and he looked at it, you know, it, it, it popped it in the VCR. And I later got a call. I was probably at the office and he, and he called me and he said, I don't know what I just saw. I've never seen it. I don't know where it came from, but we must find a way to write for this show. <laughs> so uh, we immediately started coming up with premises and uh, you know story ideas and, and submitting them without really getting much of a response. Any memories on what those early ideas were? Well, there was a, there was an early version of of what is reality that was. I mean. Um, Bob in particular was was very much into science fiction and, and you know, kind of what at the time was the the latest in technology. Uh, and I had no idea what virtual reality was, um, and so but we pitched we pitched an idea, a very very bare bones idea of virtual reality, um, and we I think we pitched another Riddler story. I I, I thought the uh, reading the series bible, I thought that the Riddler was an interesting character and. Like, well, there's a niche that we could find our way into. 
Yeah, that, so was, that Riddler, him. Riddler, we've never seen before until this show, right? Like it was always the zany Frank Gorshin, or yeah, the, it was the, the the Frank Gorshin. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Riddler, uh, and I learned this later from Marty Pasco. Was Riddler really wasn't much of a character in the uh, in the comics at all until the the sixties series kind of revived. Him. Uh, but even then, they didn't really know what to do with him beyond that sort of yeah, silly. Yeah, he was more of a Joker than a, a Riddler. But now in yeah. this in this series, he was finally like this, you know, very intelligent, suave, sophisticated, evil genius, which I love so much. Yeah, yeah, and and we actually uh, we had a take on him that um, they didn't use, but I uh, I thought it would be really interesting if he was like a teenager, like if he was a young, arrogant punk, who right? Just okay. thought he was smarter than Batman. And, kind of came up with this, you know, this whole backstory of him where he was this, you know, this super genius kid who was just totally exploited by, right. you know, uh, by you a know, father or a stepfather. Yeah, and anyway, they never used it, but I, I just thought that was, that was an interesting, you know, David Wise came up with the, the revenge, you know, the business deal, uh, you know, he was, he was cheated on business deal. And that was, that was his motivation was revenge. But I, I always thought arrogance was would be a much more interesting thing to play. The Riddler in the most recent the Batman movie with Robert Pattinson was a young teenage like evil genius punk type guy who was almost yeah. like the Zodiac. Never, I never saw it, so I no, but tell you. I'm sure. Yeah, and to be honest, everybody's got their own opinions, and I don't think it was that great. But the point is, is that that idea, that core of that idea, eventually got yeah. used. So yeah, that's cool. I like that. So, yeah, so we, you know, as I say, we pitched to the original team of uh, writer, uh, story editors, which was the the Sean Derrick, uh, Laren Bright, um, and just didn't get much of a response. Um, and Sydney said, just just wait, we're, we're going to get somebody in there that that I know that that will give you a fair shake. And that's when Martin Pasco came. Uh, right. So he said, just send send it to Marty Pasco. He knows me. He trusts my judgment. Um, you know, he'll read it. He'll he'll at least give you a fair shake on it. And Marty responded not to the stories so much, but uh, in the premises, we used some sample riddles, just kind of as plot points. And he said he liked our approach to the riddles, um, which nobody seemed to really have a, a, a take on. So that that's why the the Riddler stories kept, you know, getting kicked down the, the road. Um, number one, which I, I found out subsequently is Bruce Tim really never cared for the character. Interesting. Um, okay. So he never, he never really wanted to do Riddler stories to begin with. Yeah. Cause he's not in the uh, show much. He's only in like three or four episodes in total. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It just, he didn't, he didn't respond to it. Um, but I think there was, there was something about the virtual reality idea that at least Marty responded to. Um, and I think Bruce saw that there was visual possibilities there. So that's that's what they said. Let's do a version of the virtual reality story. Um, but let's, you know, let's really use those, um, you know, those kinds of riddles that you, uh, that you gave the premises. So that, that, that was how we got, got bored. Cool. Well, speaking of riddles, uh, when I had Bob on, uh, he said you were the riddle guy. He said that that was all you know, like you you at least were the one that was more interested in creating these riddles for Batman to solve. Um, and I coincidentally happen to have the three riddles from what is reality in front of me and <laughs> was wondering if maybe you would be able to remember the answers to some of these and see. Uh, well, well, I cheated. I just watched it before. Uh, Did you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate you doing the homework. All right. Well, here we go anyway. Marty, where does a 500-pound gorilla sleep? Anywhere he wants. That's right. What's worse than a millipede with flat feet? A uh, giraffe with a sore neck. Yeah. And finally, how do you fit five elephants into a compact car? Um, well, my answer was two in the front seat, three in the back, which is how I learned it. But I think Marty Pasco edited it to two in the front, two in the back, one in the trunk. So. Yeah, which that I love that because obviously elephants and trunk goes really well together. Yes, because clearly they could fit in the backseat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there was only two, then that would have been fine. Three right, is pushing it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then also, um, I got real Batman 66 vibes in a good way 
when uh, he's trying to solve the riddle with, if you add it all up, it'll make sense. And then he went from, right. the pop, you know, Penny, Copper, Police. Yeah, it was, that was sort of a hybrid. Was it? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, fir- the first ones were there basically for, for everyone to say, oh, we're, we're doing the Frank Orshin kind of riddles. And, and then, you know, that was the, you know, the, the switch is it's not about the answers, it's about the questions. Yes. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's a really cool twist, actually, that um, I've not really noticed until you just mentioned it now. It is more about the the questions and the answers. That's cool. But um, yeah, and then adding them all up and Alfred Punning saying it all makes sense when you add it up. It's very good. Uh, I do like that. I, I like it. Yeah, I think time. that that one was sort of inspired by, um, you know, the way the way British crossword clues go. Where it's, <laughs> you know, there's a there's a pun. There's a, you know, yeah, there's, well, us British people you know, love a, a pun. Man. Anagram. So I think that's um, Spy Magazine um, used to have their their version of the British crossword that was called the un-British crossword. So I think that was some of the inspiration oh, cool. for that particular riddle. I like that a lot. So do you have any uh, particular favorite contributions to Batman out of the ones you wrote? Like, um, obviously, you've already talked about what is reality, but maybe there's other things in that episode that we haven't gotten to yet. But yeah, as a whole, well, what, I, what I really liked um, about what is reality it was was the visual was that really particularly the third act where, where they're in the virtual reality scenario and it gets very surreal. And I'm, you know, making visual references to things like Magritte and uh, Yellow Submarine and, uh, you know, and any number of things. Just sort of going stream of consciousness in, in, in terms of where, you know, where it goes from one, uh, you know, one scenario to the next. So I thought that was and that was something that you could only do in that episode, in that scenario. Otherwise, you're, you're dealing with a, you know, largely realistic character in a in a largely realistic setting and you can use animation to make it you know more spectacular but it's you still had to more or less uh respect the laws of physics you know or at least cartoonish physics but um in that one scenario you could really use the medium in in a way that um you couldn't use it other other than you know if it's a dream or hallucination Right. Um, so I always like that that we were able to do that. Um, and um, Silicon Soul, I, I feel like we uh, we tried at least to get some real emotional depth. I think you succeeded, really, man. I love and, that episode. And, and really just answer the question, you know, ultimately at its core, you know, who and what is Batman? Um, so, uh, yeah, I feel I feel like we got there. Um, on some level and the, the the ending we always refer to you know is, is very operatic right the ending was changed because it was changed from a statement into a question where instead of saying um he had a yeah. soul he had yeah a soul. that was that was michael reeves edit and i think that was a really smart edit agreed uh, yeah um so i uh uh yeah i like that and uh um that was an example of of um you know michael was impressed by what we had done on what is reality. So when he got a slot, he said, Oh, let's, let's get those guys on. I think largely at Marty's behest. So, so uh, with, with the Silicon soul process of when they approached you, did they approach you and say, Hey, we want to do a sequel to the hard act episodes, you know, the computer. Yeah. yeah? Uh, yes. Yes. It was interesting how that, how that episode came about um, because, and I remember this because one of the things I was able to do, well, I was still working at, at Fox while we were writing in Batman. So I could see, you know, every premise, every outline, every draft of every script, and then also the storyboards. And when the storyboards came in for Heart of Steel, there was this thing that wasn't in the script. I mean, one of my jobs um, for Sydney was to read the storyboards and anything that was changed from the script to just you know, flag it so he would know, you know, to focus on that because he was largely a, a script guy as opposed to a, uh, a a visual and art guy. Kevin Altieri, the director, added this lengthy sequence of Batman versus the Batman robot. 
Right. Um, in the script, it was just it was sort of a dun, dun, dun moment of there's a Batman robot. And, you know, if, if this doesn't get shot down, then it, it, it's really going to escalate. Uh, but Kevin, who who was, you know, very much a, uh, a strong and opinionated guy and still is that you can't just introduce a Batman robot and not have him fight it. So he, <laughs> he you know, he boarded out this very elaborate fight between Batman and the Batman robot. And of course, there just wasn't time for it. Yeah. So it, it all had to get cut, um, much to uh, everyone's disappointment. Uh, so when we were brought into the meeting with Michael Reeves um, and, and Alan Burnett, um, we were told yeah, this, this was the background, which I was familiar with. So we want to bring him back. We want to bring the Batman robot back so we can do a whole episode around that and get that fight that Kevin did. Yeah. Um, so I think Michael had the he had the he had the opening scene. You know, this is he pitched out to us the opening scene, which we loved. Right. Um, and he said, where do we go from there? And so we, we batted a few ideas uh, around. And, and I think we more or less came up with the, the framework of the story, if not all the details. And then Bob and I talked it through. And then I think at that point, uh, we were writing both. Batman and, and X-Men talk about an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> um, and Bob was a huge, huge X-Men fan. So he was like, I'll take X-Men. You can take Batman. Right. I'm like, okay, good. I'm good with that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I ended up doing most of the, uh, at least the, the, I would do the first draft on everything and then, and then Bob would edit. And then similarly, Bob would do all the first draft on the X-Men stuff. And then I would edit. Um, but okay. yeah, I pretty much took over that episode um, in terms of, structuring it out and, um you know and, and scripting it so yeah most of that um was me it's a great episode man like it's one of my personal favorites because as you said it, it gets into the core of what it means to be batman and it's it's pretty graphic in a way that you know really left an impression so i'm your i was your core audience yeah i was like eight when this show came out even younger, I think, a little younger when it first started. But I was the one that was obviously it was being made for. And I remember this episode, seeing this for the first time, when two scenes, when Batman, Robot Batman, stumbles into Wayne Manor and Alfred finds him and he's like, what's happened to me? And I remember like all of his, his like, you know, robot right, guts his, sparking. Yeah. And, and I remember being like, holy shit this is like you know it's just immediately got my attention and quite scary and then it's also when he removes his like i guess you called it like a rubber face or whatever it is right, so right, right. Face. and there's this like really graphic noise that goes along this like wet kind of slush yeah noise. yeah the sound, the sound <laughs> design really went overboard on that yeah that but it it left such an impression it might have scared me but what I loved and what I always remembered is the ending where even Robot Batman, when he thinks he's taken a life, he just can't handle it. And it's like, that's, you know, the one thing that makes him Batman and obviously and kind of connects him to his humanity. And he just shuts down. He basically short circuits and destroys the computer and such. And it's always it's such a great episode. And to do that in 22 minutes, like my hat's off to you, because that's <laughs> it's a really cool episode. I love it a lot. Well, uh, it's it's also beautifully directed. I, I, I still have a copy of the, the storyboard for, for that and for um, for what is reality. And they're, they are both storyboards are just works of art. But um, uh, I think because uh, it's it's not as obviously a, a visual animatable idea as beyond the the, the sci-fi of it all. Um, just to, the the shot composition and the, the way it's directed is is really beautiful. Um, I think was that Boyd or was that Dick Sebast? I can't remember who directed that. Oh, I think it was Dick who was on his Silicon Soul. Let me just check really quick. Um, yeah, I, I, I want to credit yeah, uh, where credit is due. And the other thing is it was animated by uh, overseas by TMS. So the animation is really fluid and, and, and nice. And Yes, because um, there was uh, Acom, who was the usual. Right. A Acom, I think, did Silicon, um, did uh, what is reality. And they did. Yeah, they didn't they didn't 
mess it up. <laughs> Just, you know, I can say that, but if if TMS had animated it, it, it would be uh, it would be gorgeous. Look, I think I think what is reality is Acom's best episode that they did for the show, as far as the the animation. Yeah, it, d- it didn't have quite as much of the stiffness as as a lot of the Acom yeah. episodes did. Yeah. Uh, um, by the way, so yeah. it's, it's Boyd Kirkland who did his silicone. It was Boyd. It yeah. was Boyd. Um, yeah, the other thing I, I remember is we we saw the rough cut because um, there's uh, there's rain. the opening scene has rain, right? It's a thunderstorm. Yeah, and it's it the, was a very cuts. very poorly. It was very very poorly animated rain, and we're like, oh no no no, we want two face part two rain. <laughs> and apparently, so did Warner Brothers because by the time the final cut came in, it was it was two face part two rain. Yeah, that, that's so, a, that's uh, a great we, way to we put it. Very happy to see. I love how you guys re- referencing other episodes as far as like that's what we want. We want Two Face Rain. I think that's great. Well, again, when you're when you're seeing every single process of every single episode, uh, uh, you you just you know what you know what can be done and what can't be done. So yeah, uh, of course that you know just something that simple and uh, you know we were we were grateful that everybody felt the same way because it. it totally made the difference I, I, somewhere i may still have the, the a video of the of the rough cut and it did the ring looked terrible oh, i'd love to see that uh when we had bob on uh, last time he uh, didn't know and i don't know if you know but um robot batman is not only a toy because they've redone all of the animated series figures they i did not yeah, so you, they're really detailed. They're amazing figures. Um, I have to get my hands on one. Yeah, so the only the only Batman toy I own is, of course, the Riddler. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, they yeah they re-released all of them. They look fantastic. They're larger than the originals that were sold when I was a kid. And oh, that's nice. they have a ton of accessories like your robot Batman has like switchable heads, like the half face or like the full robot head and like all the little like things like his wires are sticking out of his guts and, and all of that. Oh, that's that's so cool. And you then really also, uh, that one down. yeah, you're also a Funko Pop as well. Robot Batman is a Funko Pop, which is obviously huh? huge collectible. So I'll show you the Funko Pop first. Uh, there's two versions. There's half and half. Funko. Oh, that's fun. And then the other version is full face removed. Funko huh. Pop. And does it does okay? It says Batman the Animated Series. Does it spe- specify the episode title or or just just Robot Batman? It just says Batman Robot Final Figure. Yeah, but the no. um, but there's your figure fully realized. Oh wow! Oh yeah! No, that's that's straight out of the episode. Isn't that cool? Yeah, so you got the That is really out. cool. I, I think I may have to get my hands on one of those. Yeah, they, you know what, man? Some of them are, are quite rare. I'm not sure if that is... It might be quite rare, actually. But, um, yeah, they've made a huge resurgence of the toys from this show. And, again, it's just because all of the kids have grown up and now they're sharing it with their kids and it just continues yeah. to become popular. And I, I seem to recall there were some toys for the show, there, but there weren't a lot Oh, I had them all. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was very fortunate. And yeah, my brother and I, we had, there was quite a lot. Um, there wasn't, you know, figures like Robot Batman. Obviously, they would just make the main villains like the Riddler, which yeah. you said you have. Yeah, but there were a ton of different types of Batman and loads of Bat vehicles. And Right. Well, that, that's what it all, always boiled down to is, is all they would do is make different versions of Batman. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and sometimes yeah. they wanted to, you know, have it in an episode so it makes sense. Like uh, I forget what episode. I think it was Joker's Wild, where Batman has a glider, and they're like, "Batman needs a glider." And I, right. I, I, I've heard this story, and they're like, "Why?" And it's like, "Well, because we want to have we want to sell a toy." So want to sell a toy, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course, and they didn't yeah, do that, that was, a lot. That was an even bigger challenge when it was Superman the animated series. Yeah. So your Toy Man episode is another one that I adore um because he's just so menacing you guys both you and bob really knew how to like leave a lasting impression of someone that can just give you the chills when you watch it and i think he's incredible because he's so he's looks so innocent but like a creepy dummy obviously and there's no expression on right. his face except yeah, the, the, the the visual i think was paul dini's idea right um, okay uh because he wanted to get away from that you know kind of that weird guy with the bowler hat and the, you know, the strange gray hair. 
but yeah, I, I remember taking uh, taking the meeting with Paul and and Alan and and discussing that and just you know trying to make this this creepy childlike figure um, that was more than a little inspired by Michael Jackson. Oh, interesting. Okay, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah. Right. The creepy bit. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the creepy. You know, I'm doing this for the children. Oh, yeah. And he did have that sort of like docile voice that Michael Jackson had, right? Where it was just yeah. kind of... Yeah, it was, yeah. Bud, it was Bud Court, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing performance as well. Yeah, I love that episode. And um, I obviously, as I said, I grew up watching Batman and Spider-Man. But um, Superman was one that I watched, but I was never a big Superman guy. It was always Batman for me if I had to choose. But in my later years, over the last couple of years, I've gone back and that Superman the Animated Series is fucking awesome. It's so damn good. It's Yeah, yeah. It's we were, home we were disappointed that we didn't get to uh, write any more of them, but they they went, uh, they stopped using freelancers for the most part. They, they went for a straight, um, just staff written show. Gotcha, uh, okay. I thought they did a, yeah, I thought they did a brilliant job. All, all those... Uh, all those writers. So as a freelancer for Batman, then what was the writing process like? I mean, you kind of hinted at it before where you would just be brought in. Was it like, here's a quick pitch and then go write the rest of it? Um, well, in the case of what is reality, we were pitching ideas. And so um, we, we kind of initiated that. But then after that, for both um, Silicon Soul and for Lockup, it was uh, it was either Marty Pasco or Michael Reeves contacting us. Like, hey, you want to write another Batman? Wow. <laughs> of course we do. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, we'd set a meeting, and we usually uh, uh, the uh, the meeting for Silicon Soul, I think, was just us and Michael and Alan Burnett, and then I because uh, Paul had come up with the idea for Lockup. Um, when we met on that, it was Alan and, and Paul and Michael who story edited it and, and, and Bob and I. Uh, so, yeah, with Luck Up, um, when I spoke to Bob, he said that was obviously one that he was um, a little more hands on. And it was Travis Bickle inspired, you know, behind the mm -hmm. character and such, which I thought was really cool and didn't know until I chatted with him. But what parts of the episode do you remember working on of that? What were some of the ideas that you brought to the table? Um, well, what was interesting was that that um, that was a point where because I had been the point man on uh, what is reality in Silicon Soul, and Bob had been the point man on the uh, up till that point the three episodes of X Men that um, we co wrote. We made a conscious decision. It's like Bob's like I want to put my stamp on Batman. Well, right. I want to put my stamp on X Men. So uh, so Bob did um did lock up and then i did the the x-men savage land and savage heart two-parter right um so we each got to kind of you know these flagship shows we each got to say okay at least i have i had one or in my case two um that are you know that that mostly came from me yeah. um so i think that was that was a smart move on on both of our parts so i don't i think i um I, I'm trying to remember with lockup. I, I think I helped figure out the um, you know kind of the client how the climax would work with the with the tilted ship and and sort of the logic of that. I think I may have come up with the with the ending um, and the idea is that we never really explain how Batman escaped. The, uh, <laughs> he's just Batman. He just does. It's yeah. just, he's Batman. He can do yeah, it. Yeah. And someday that. he'll tell Robin how he did it. Someday. <laughs> you know, we, we imply that, the, that he figured out how to do it, but we didn't bother explaining it. So yeah. I, I think that that may have come from me, but it was, um, yeah, it was, it was mostly Bob. I think I probably did some, some polish on it. I, I don't, recall coming up with any specific lines on it uh if he whatever he credits me for he's usually pretty accurate so gotcha i was gonna say it's really cool how you guys collaborated like that and kind of could hop to shows that you were passionate about or uh, brands or franchises you were passionate about and get to write and then also not only be in the driver's seat but be in the editing passenger seat on other ones as well whilst you're on batman he's an x-men or vice versa that's really cool because then you get to kind of explore both worlds at the same time right 
Yeah, yeah, and that was that was sort of like the evolution of our partnership. Is we you know we started um, when we were writing Beetlejuice. It was like, well, I'll take Act One, you take Act Two, then we'll swap them, then we'll edit them, um, and then as we got to be doing more shows at one time, it's like, all right, I'll I'll take this script, you take that script, we'll swap them and re-edit them, um, and then it, at, at the it got to the point where uh, very late in our partnership, it's like, I'll take this series, you take that series. <laughs> and if you have time, you know, read over my stuff and, and edit it. But if you don't, don't worry about it. Gotcha. Uh, was there any character that you wanted to write for Batman that you didn't get a chance to write for? I don't recall. I mean, the one I really, I mean, I wanted to do another Riddler episode. I okay. never really got, I mean, we wanted to do the episode that, essentially woke him up from his, you know, his, his coma or his catatonic state. Um, and I had the germ of, of an idea that was sort of like awakenings with the Riddler, where the only thing he would respond to was, was Batman. And, um, you know, it was sort of a Hannibal Lecter situation where there are riddle like crimes going on, but he can't possibly be perpetrating them. Oh. because he's there catatonic state so but he's the only one who can maybe figure out who's behind it or how to stop this uh, and the only one who seems to be able, getting any kind of response out of him is batman so they keep having these these sessions and and the, the reveal at the end is what the riddler has been doing has been hypnotizing batman and planting this post-hypnotic suggestion and batman has been the one that's been uh, wow i love that um could never quite work out the structure of it um, and again, you know, sort of fighting the wall of, of Bruce Tim just not being interested in the Riddler at all. So um, never really got anybody um, interested enough to say, hey, let's bat it around and figure out this story. Oh, that would have been um, but that so cool. Always, that was always the, uh, you know, the carrot that Michael Reeves would dangle in front of us. Do you want to do another Batman? We might <laughs> be able to get your Riddler story. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love how um, much you wanted to do Riddler as well, because even when I asked you, you know, other characters, you're like, I just want to stick with the Riddler. And that, that's really great because, as I said, I think he was underused in this show, being that they created such a new and very, like, charismatic character with John Glover voicing him as well was amazing. Yeah, and he he did a fantastic job, but I felt like you know you, Paul Dini was so associated with the Joker. It's like you, you can't write an ep you know once once Paul had the Joker, it was like it would be foolish to try and write a right. Joker episode as as good as Paul Dini. Um, and you know the Penguin was sort of the villain that you put into the episode where it, the villain could be anybody. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, there was there was only so much you could do with Man Bat. Nobody really quite figured out the Scarecrow, I think, until much, much later. Much later, yeah. I mean, even did. even the design of him. Kept yes, it did. Yeah. And they finally got um, it right towards the end. So, yeah, that was that was always because uh, the great thing about the Scarecrow is was he had he hadn't appeared in any previous incarnation you know in film and television so he was he was um fresh territory but i, I feel like never quite got a good scarecrow episode maybe, yeah. maybe one of the much much later ones if there is a villain that we you know that we could sort of say take ownership of um that was you know just sort of a practical way of, of, of trying to that's a good approach yeah radar. Um, and it's just, the it's, you know, there was there was the need there. There was, you know, this is an iconic villain that they're underusing. So if, you know, if you got these writers who at least we feel we can write them well, um, we thought that might give us more of an in. Um, and it gave us an in. We just never got the uh, opportunity to, to do the Riddler again. Yeah, well, I mean, I did love what is reality, and I, I love your idea, and it's it's something that now I want to see because I can see Batman, <laughs> I can see that sort of Silence of the Lamb style that you described, Hannibal Lecter, you know, and the the whole jail cell situation with Riddler in there, and then the switch at the end. That's really cool. I love that. Never heard that before. That's really cool. Um, do you have any memorabilia from your time working on the show? Um, I I do i mean this is audio only so i mean i could show you my stuff i showed so you this is this is my brother and i's favorite part of the podcast because i get to see it 
And the, listen, the listeners don't. So you're, you're basically saying, can I tantalize your audience yes. that, that can't see? Yeah. Yes, um, exactly. Sure. Hang on. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with, I'm going to move my computer because it's on the wall. Oh, okay. Well, that's the that animation is, cell. Um, what is reality? Yeah, love that. This standee sound, wow. this came from uh, Fox. You can see the Fox logo. Fox oh, Kansas wow. Logo. That's, uh, that's a pristine looking cardboard. Yeah, the, the, uh, the ears are a little ratty, but this sat on my, uh, my desk at Fox Kids. Awesome. I, I love that. That's really cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I love this. Um, you've probably seen these. So is that the, um, the musical score uh, on vinyl? No, no. This is um, what would you call this? This is a, a press kit. Oh no, I haven't this, seen these before. No, this was the Warner Brothers put them out, and Fox Kids put them out. So mine is the Fox Kids. Oh wow, no, I haven't and, seen those. Um, I'm gonna angle this down so you can see it because it's really cool. Uh, so you have this nice. Oh, so you got a layout of all the vehicles. And right, you got pop a pop up. Whoa. Batman. That's crazy. We've got Batman popping out. That's, that's, yeah, I love so you that. Got that. And wait a minute, wait for it. And then you, you get to the next page, and angle this down to get the full effect. Oh my God. It's the same sort of cardboard cutout that you have as a standee. Yeah, right. And then some wow. images from the. God, I mean, so we haven't really talked about the design of this show as well. And just looking at the design of the characters in Gotham, like, you know, as you said, when you first saw that um, that test that they did, like, you know, what was going through your guys' head when you saw what these characters looked like, what Gotham looked like, the whole show? You know, what were you, what were you thinking? I was thinking, oh, my God, they got it right. Right, okay. Um, I was like, like, what a perfect idea to do Batman in the Max Fleischer Superman style. Yeah, yeah. That's brilliant. It, it's, it, you know, and it's stylized. It, looks good in animation it's fluid it's everything that uh you know a any previous incarnation of the superhero show has not been absolutely so um so I, that was it was just it, it blew me away and so yeah it was, it was and and also just feeling like wow i am a privileged insider to have seen this to know what's coming yeah um, yeah exactly uh, cause it's like, this is light years beyond anything that, that that's been on television animation. And still to this day, you know, like there's a reason. Yeah. That this series. Yeah, well, is that, still that period, particularly at Warner brothers in the early nineties, even though Spielberg wasn't involved in Batman, he was infusing uh, obviously a lot of money, yeah. um, you know, uh, high budgets with tiny tunes and animaniacs. Um, and that really allowed, and, and Warner Brothers really had to compete with with uh, Disney for for TV eyeballs because they, you know, they had introduced the Disney Afternoon. Right. Um, but for some reason, I think with Disney, it always felt like, well, this is a step down. I never watched it as a kid. Yeah, I mean, just in terms of the, I mean, the you know, the storytelling was was very good and the writing was very good. You know, the animation was very good for television, but always felt like a step down for Disney, like it's sort of like B-grade Disney. Whereas with Warner Brothers, you felt like, well, this is a step up. Yeah. Um, so so, I, think I mean, that, with Mar the Marvel animation as well, it was a step up, but it just it didn't have the same style. It didn't have the and fluidity. Substance. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and still, I mean, even when I was working for marvel more recently you know it's recently as five years ago um you know we kept saying do a stylized yeah version of and they just it, it they just didn't they never would do it the only one really that was able to do it at marvel was uh spectacular spider-man because it was sony really pulling the strings at that point right right um, yeah so it's yeah it's unfortunate because i i did Guardians of the Galaxy, and how great would that have been in that stylized, uh, you know, sort of Scotty Young from the the Rocket Raccoon? Um, oh yeah, books, yeah. If you're familiar with them, I am. Yeah, uh, that and they just they just no, no. It's got to be sort of realistic, and it's got to you know match with the 
with the features. And it's it's such a shame that they're. Trying I, it's to a adapt. missed it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, um, because make it your own. Like make it something that's going to stand. Even though you may watch the Guardians movies or any of the other Marvel movies, like kids aren't dumb. You know what I mean? They're going to be like, okay, yeah. that's Guardians, but just because they look different than the the live action doesn't mean that there's a disconnect. It's going to be like yeah. that's that's another version I, that I love. Again, they they have their reasons. I don't quite understand them yeah sure um you know and i think some of it was that you know we have all these other shows and we want them to feel like they're all part of the same universe and they really weren't but no no it was decisions made much higher up the food chain than yeah i was so you know but i mean it's uh, it's interesting because you've got so many different batman movies that all look different with even yeah. different batman in them but then you've got a cartoon equally that was different when it started. It looked different from the Tim Burton movies, but created a whole DC animated universe, right? Like you had Batman, then you had yeah. Superman, and then you had Justice League and Batman Justice Beyond. Justice League and Justice yeah. League Unlimited. Yeah. And just, yeah, exactly. And even the Zeta project, you know what I mean? And Static Well, Shock. and it, it helped that, you know, ultimately the, the glue that holds all of them together is Bruce Tim, where, yeah. you know, you, it kept that consistent vision um so i think a lot of that just had to do with bruce's passion for it and warner brothers willingness to continue to support him and, and you know keep him employed absolutely I and mean, it sounds like he's going to do it again possibly there's a new kate crusader show coming out so i mean obviously we all got to wait and see what what's happening with that but um yeah maybe they're they're finally gonna go back to creating a sort of stylized look that gives birth to a whole other series of cartoons or even just one good series about a character instead of trying to make them all look samesy because then they're hard to tell apart and then you don't know the good ones from the bad, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think, you know, you, you, you have to remember that if you're, if you're going to do it in animation, it's, it's a visual medium and, and you know, you, you have the, um, the, the leeway to make it stylized and the more stylized you get, more fluid it's going to look right um that the closer you hew to the comic book look or the toy look it's you know it's going to look stiff and yeah. it's just going to feel lesser than um as opposed to you know becoming this this other thing that is that is wholly itself yeah and all the other things like toys can follow once you create the thing you know people yeah. can make a toy out of anything you know so yeah uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the the greatest example was a, a, a show that I did, Transformers Animated, right? Where we, you know, we took the approach of, you know, let's do Transformers as if it were just a cartoon. Um, Interesting. And, okay. You know, the um, the whole design of the, you know, the the uh, the design ethos of the show was, you know, sort of leaning more toward Hanna Barbera. You know, and that that kind of you know, not quite squash and stretch, but definitely stylized. And miraculously, they were able to make the toys look like the uh, the animated figures. So that's it can awesome. be done. It can be yeah. done. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great to hear. I'm glad because uh, I mean, I'm not watching a lot of new cartoons. Obviously, I'm I'm sticking with the ones that I was a kid. Hell, I even do a podcast about one. You know, so uh, that's it, good that they're still trying in some areas at least. Um, Okay, so can you share what you're working on now? You've, you mentioned a bunch of things you've just worked on or have worked on over the last few years. Is there anything you're working on now that you can share, or is that all hush hush? Um, no, I mean, I mean, the most recent thing that I've done is uh, Octonauts Above and Beyond, which is uh, on Netflix. You can watch it now, and there's uh, uh, there's still two more seasons coming. Okay, uh, I have no idea when or where. <laughs> uh, but that's uh, uh, that's that's my most recent project. Um, currently, mostly doing some freelance scripts for different shows and, and developing uh, a few projects, but uh, um, nothing currently in production. Cool. All right. Well, I want to see your Rid Lost Riddler episode, so I'm in the champion. For that <laughs> well, I yeah, you get get uh, DC, or we'll we'll do it as a uh, an audio drama um all right marty well it's been a pleasure to speak to you man thank you so much for coming on the show 
Oh, uh, same here. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I've learned quite a lot today and lots of stuff that I'm going to tell Will afterwards and he's going to go, ah, oh, shit, I wish I was on that one. <laughs> 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 Thanks, buddy. My pleasure. Well, that was fun. Who's for Chinese?